Kaifu, thank you so much for joining us today. We are very lucky to have you. You were on national television last week in the US uh, where 60 Minutes called you the Oracle of AI. You like that title? Uh, I, I've not worked for the company Oracle, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that meant something else. You um, have been saying that AI is going to be bigger than electricity. Mm -hmm. Could you please explain that? That's quite a, that's quite a statement. Yes, well, AI is uh, going to be used in every industry, uh, reducing costs, improving performance, and disrupting business models. We've already begun to see that in um, all kinds of areas, from finance to internet. Uh, today's most powerful companies are rebranding themselves as AI companies, from IBM, Microsoft, Google, to Facebook. Uh, and also AI will, because AI will have such a, a huge change over the whole industry, all industries, yet it will be much faster than electricity. Because electricity took many decades and even a century to build out the electrical grid and all the applications. AI is running on the cloud now. So um, it's, um, one could say it's arguably about as important and significant, but certainly a lot faster. One of the questions I and many people have is we've been hearing about AI for a long time. And if we could, I'd love to play a clip of uh, when you were on another TV show, Good Morning America, uh, 26 years ago with John Scully from Apple, uh, giving one of the first uh, demonstrations of speech recognition technology that you had created. This is quite a classic. Sci-fi well remember Hal the Talking Computer from the film 2001. Well, reality is a step closer to science fiction with Apple Computer's new developed program that allows its computers to understand and respond to spoken commands. And for a first look at this new technology, joining us are John Scully, the chief executive officer of Apple, and Kai Fu Lee, the inventor of Apple speech recognition technology, and also with us this morning, Casper the computer. Nice to have all three of you here. Thank now, you. some people might say, Mr. Scully, come on, there are other computers that, that do recognize voices, and I think even synthesize voices, but how's Casper different? Well, John, this is the first time we've had a computer that can handle continuous speech the way we're having a conversation now. It's also speaker independent, which means it can recognize you or me or Kai Fu or anyone else. You have to train it to, yeah. to one And voice. it works on a personal computer. This happens to be a Macintosh we're running it on. That's kind of amazing. How does it do that? Well, there are two breakthroughs in here. One is speaker independence, which means we train it on thousands of speakers, so it learns what English sounds like from a variety of speakers. Ah. And secondly, we, ha we have enabled it to um, recognize continuous speech from a trillion sentences. A trillion different sentences? Yes. All right, now we're going to give you, go ahead. So, Kaifu, I guess a little known story uh, behind that segment is that you and uh, Mr. Scully were quite nervous about the computer working, and you actually had someone behind the curtain. Uh, yeah, the demo did work, by the way, but uh, I was very nervous he wasn't, because at the time, uh, when got, we got the invitation, he said, Kaifu, what is the likelihood of a catastrophic failure? And I said, about 10%. He says, we're canceling the show, unless you can get it to 1%. So he was thinking it would be easy just to tweak some software, but it was all custom hardware. We could not possibly tweak it. So I ended up bringing two computers, each with 10% chance of failure, and a human. <laughs> <laughs> and a human who had a switch. Once one crashed, he switches to the other. So, so I told John, down to 1%, not to worry, but. <laughs> And so you didn't end up needing the human. We didn't. We were in the 90% okay. case. However, at the end of the show, Joan London came to the backstage and she saw the human with the switch. She said, I knew that was fake. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what took so long in a sense? I mean, you were on to this. You had one of the first PhDs in AI uh, in the late 80s, I believe. Um, why, why has it taken almost 30 years for, for AI to really accelerate? Uh, well, the algorithms we had at the time were not nearly as good as deep learning, which truly revolutionized, revolutionized the whole domain, dramatically dropped the error rate to beating human. So at the time we showed the demo, we're probably 10 times worse than human, five to 10 times worse than human. Now it's better than human. And that crossing that threshold was important. But deep learning doesn't, isn't just a magical 
software algorithm. It also required a ton of data to train the system. Mm -hmm. uh, when I did my PhD thesis, I had the world's largest database for speech recognition, and it was 100 megabytes. So it's like five songs on your iPhone now. <laughs> uh, when I was at Apple, maybe we had um, maybe a gigabyte. But now people are regularly using you know, 100 terabytes for training. So we've gone up a factor of one million in data. And AI is just so hungry for data. And with more data and more compute power uh, and better algorithms, it really crossed, that, crossed the threshold. And that's what uh, is, is made, made it blossom in this area. Mm -hmm. In your book, um, uh, The AI Superpowers, China and Silicon Valley and the New World Order, you write about how China is very, very quickly catching up to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? I would argue China has already caught up in the um, implementation, execution, and monetization of AI. Uh, U.S. is clearly still ahead, and actually Europe is quite strong in basic research. But China has gone faster to translate that to value. I think there are a couple of fundamental reasons. Uh, first, I think the most important is the amount of data. As I mentioned, uh, data is the rocket fuel to make AI work great. And China has so much data, so many users, each user using uh, the phone, the apps, so much more ways. So by breadth and depth, arguably China has 10 times as much data as US or Europe. And in the era of uh, AI, if uh, data is the new oil, then China is the new OPEC. I think that's one analogy. <laughs> uh, but in addition to that, China has a very strong VC ecosystem. So tenacious entrepreneurs funded by VCs who work uh, 100 hours a week. I mean, the entrepreneurs, not, not us VCs. Uh, 100 hours a week, uh, incre work incredibly hard in finding every which, every which way that there's value to be created for the user, money to be made. And AI sort of gave the entrepreneurs a magical knob where you can say, I want to tweak for more user minutes. I want to tweak for more revenue. I want to tweak for more profit. Of course, that, there's issue with that, and that's what got you know, Facebook into some trouble. Uh, but that is such a magical knob that no business person has ever had. And Chinese entrepreneurs are there tweaking the knob every day. So those, I think, are the main reasons. Of course, the government incentives and support is also important. Uh, but mostly the data, the entrepreneurs, the VCs, the ecosystem. So many people in the West have looked at China and technology, and they've said, you know, China either copies, there's protectionism, or, you know, in the case of AI, well, the government is funding it to the tune of billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But you write that it's, some, it's not any of those, those uh, factors. Could you talk about the trip to Silicon Valley that your yeah. entrepreneurs uh, took? Sure. Uh, first, all three of those statements independently were true at some point in time. It's just that China moves so quickly, people forget things change. Uh, Chinese entrepreneurs were copycats, but they now innovate. There are new apps coming out uh, worth uh, hundreds of billions of dollars that have never been heard of in the US or Europe. Um, and um, protectionism is not an issue because uh, Chinese com companies are actually stronger, at least on Chinese soil, uh, than American companies, product for product, feature for feature. Um, and the Chinese government's support is a little bit after the fact. It's certainly helpful. Companies are happy to get it. But uh, it was the private capital and the in independent private entrepreneurs who made the $18 billion companies in AI. This is just in AI that China has. The, I think the uh, government funding is uh, maybe coming to help them a little bit more, building infrastructure. But it's not what the government money, money that made them. So um, I, I run a VC. We've invested in uh, 45 AI companies. Uh, four of which have become unicorns, currently valued at about 21 billion. And uh, still regularly, we take our entrepreneurs to visit the Silicon Valley because we believe uh, there are things to be learned, a lot of people with more experience, um, and also uh, great innovation. But uh, when they came back, they, their number, number two takeaway was, wow, these people are, in fact, quite innovative out of the box. The number one impression was they don't work very hard. No. Um, when they went to, uh, uh, you, well, you name your favorite company, any one of the companies, Google, Facebook, Oracle, uh, Salesforce, went to visit the mall, and the uh, parking lots were empty at uh, 7. 
and, in, and then on weekends, nobody could get any meetings. And the, the entrepreneurs are so frustrated. It's like, how can we not use the weekend time? We are, you know, we're, we're move away from our companies here to learn in Silicon Valley. Nobody would meet with us. And then I eventually found a bunch of Chinese entrepreneurs in the Bay Area who would meet with them. <laughs> in, in, in China, uh, people call, it's either 996 or 997. 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week, or seven days a week. You choose. And the ones that are six days a week get touted as the... They usually lose to the 997s. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, you uh, have been making some pretty bold predictions about where this is going to end up. Uh, uh, China, you think, will start dominating um, the app world, mm -hmm. um, will start dominating AI startups. Where does this go from here? Well, I think China and U.S. will be neck and neck for the next five years in various types of AI. China will be ahead in some areas, uh, face recognition, speech recognition, machine translation, drones. Uh, U.S. will be ahead in certain areas, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, business AI. Uh, U.S., Europe, and Japan may be ahead in robotics, so it's case by case, but if you think of it as one pie with a dollar sign on it, uh, China and U.S. will each take a very large piece. Uh, that's the, the, the likely outcome. I also think the Chinese companies will naturally go beyond the Chinese borders, because if what I said is right, namely that there is innovation and that um, uh, the entrepreneurs are really good, then there's no reason that Chinese software can only win in Chinese markets. So I anticipate there to be a, a likely bifurcation, in fact, a parallel universe, where roughly half the world will be using mostly American software, and half the world will be mostly using Chinese software in about the five years' time. So we kind of have a bipolar world in a sense, the U.S. and yeah. China. Yeah, I'm not an advocate of it. I don't think it's necessarily good for the users, but I think the, that's the path we're on. Given the state of tensions between the U.S. and China, uh, the, the word superpower in the title of your book, do you feel like we've entered a bit of a cold war already? I, I certainly hope not. Um, there are talks going on. Uh, and we know the academic community is uh, very much interlinked. If you go to um, what used to be called NIPS or any one of the AI conferences, you really see incredibly collegiate and cordial and truly uh, friends among the uh, Americans, Chinese, and Europeans uh, sharing ideas and uh, putting things in the open source and uh, publishing things in real time, not waiting until a journal. So I would hate to predict that kind of kindred uh, spirit will go away, but certainly that is a risk if the current tensions continue. Now, I want to talk about Europe, which is obviously right in the middle, uh, and uh, privacy concerns are obviously very big here. They're growing in the U.S. Um, I have to ask, you know, a, a company like Face++, the use of facial recognition in China, there are many who have, who have moral issues and worry mm -hmm. that it could be used to track people in, in ways that are quite troubling. How do, you, how do you square the different standards um, uh, for the use of such technology? Right. Well, I think um, different cultures do have different views about privacy. So I think first, I think we have to uh, understand that not the whole world has exactly the same view. Uh, that said, I do think every culture wants to protect uh, every citizen wants his, his or hers privacy to be protected at some level. Um, I would think it's kind of like a knob where each user should have the right to uh, go for a lot of privacy or a lot of convenience slash security. It, it isn't, I don't think it is merely an inalienable right. Certainly you're entitled to feel that way. I think it is a trade-off between uh, convenience and security versus privacy. And I think everybody has a line where he or she would draw to to um, basically give up the privacy in order to win the other benefits. For example, um, almost every country has uh, cameras in the airports because we're concerned about hijacking. Uh, so that's one line that is drawn. Um, and I think um, uh, there are all the users of Google and Facebook, if you're still on it, you are accepting that the company has your private data and will deal with it responsibly. Otherwise, you would withdraw. So there is a line. So I think uh, I am a huge admirer of the, the, uh, the policymakers and believers in, in Europe who want to really 
uh, go out to bat for the individual privacy. But I would uh, suggest that they also consider this not as a completely black and white issue, that there, every, there is a line and to find that right line. I would further suggest that um, if the uh, privacy protection went to the extreme, then the, um, uh, then the um, monetization, the value creation uh, will come to a halt. Now, because AI is in fact a centralizing technology, uh, it benefits from all the data being gathered. If you force them to be separated, then the value will be lower. Now, I understand many policymakers here believe it's wise to slow down AI, and many of them are, are, are willing to accept the consequences. Uh, so all I'm saying is understand that there are consequences, and to the extent that you accept them, then, uh, then that's fine. Last point is that in making a policy, it's incredibly important to get the technologists in the room. Um, when you make uh, the next version of GDPR or something else, uh, it's great to have ethicists and policymakers and uh, uh, consumer advocates in there, but also make sure you have a technologist in the room so that you know each of the regulations, what are the possible consequences, and, um, and, and think about it that way. When You made some comments last week about Europe and said that um, uh, it's not even in the running for the bronze position uh, in AI. Um, could you please explain what what is is it the lack of a uh, you know we were just hearing that the VC you know uh, system here is growing but it's just not what it is um, in Silicon Valley in China. Yeah, I think the main point I was making is that there is no bronze medal, right? When the when the gold and silver um, achieve so much. Uh, who gets the bronze is kind of ir irrelevant. And that's kind of the main, the main point. <laughs> um, I think the, uh, but as far as what could Europe do to get a meaningful bronze out of this um, competition or maybe some hope for silver, uh, the game is certainly not over. I think there are a number of things that are very strong in Europe. I think the academia is very strong, but all the PhDs go work for American companies. So you're not really monetizing that or using that. Uh, the VC ecosystem uh, is improving, but still a huge gap from either China or Silicon Valley. And I think that is a huge issue because VCs and entrepreneurs help each other grow. And um, um, I think that's the second, uh, second aspect. And um, uh, I, I think Europe uh, as a market how can they come together as more of one market is important because English-speaking countries are more one market. China is one market, and, and that's another, another element. So there are good things and there are issues to be dealt with. Um, I, I certainly um, have huge respect for a lot of the academia, academia here. In fact, if you look at the three inventors of deep learning, uh, I think all of them have Europe were Europeans, um, when they were born anyway, I don't know if they still yeah. are. Yeah. So great schools, great universities, but somehow when it reaches commercialization, there isn't, doesn't seem to be the ecosystem and the, um, um, uh, the, the large market and the capital for them to realize their, their dreams. Mm -hmm. I want to open it up to a couple questions, but first I um, uh, want to talk about the impact of AI and work. Uh, you have uh, commented that you think up to 40% of all work could be impacted by AI, white collar and blue collar jobs. Uh, how soon will this happen and, and what can we do? Uh, so technically, I think in the next 15 years, that displacement will happen. Some of, some of it will be one for one displacement. So AI for a person, like a customer service or a cashier or a truck driver. Uh, some, of, some of it will be through industry disruptions um, where a complete industry is changed, that you, we borrow money from apps and not banks, thereby the loan officers are out of work. Uh, so those things will happen, and there is a, a lengthy discussion in my book about um, the types of jobs. Uh, but however, there's uh, a lot of reasons for hope still. Uh, first, I think, uh, all the jobs that you're in, all the creative jobs, strategic jobs, jobs that require uh, th planning and jobs that require dealing with uncertainty, those things AI is not good at. AI is just one tool that optimizes an objective function based on a large amount of data within one domain. So if you're multi-domain, you're strategic, you're planning, you're creative, you're building something new, AI cannot touch that. So that, those jobs are safe. 
Uh, secondly, uh, the human-to-human -human connection jobs uh, are also safe, and uh, in fact, they will be growing. Uh, for example, uh, elderly care, nurses, uh, teachers, uh, the future doctors, uh, uh, tour guides, concierge, those jobs will even uh, be in greater demand because AI cannot fake the human-to-human the -human trust, empathy, and compassion. And even if AI did an 80% job faking it, we're not, we're not going to accept it. So I think those jobs are not only safe, but also very good jobs for people who are being displaced to consider retraining to move into. And then there's going to be jobs that are going to be created by AI. Uh, there will be lots of them, but we, I have no idea what they are. Um, the, why, why not? Because if you go back 20 years, the internet started. None of us could have predicted the, the 10 million Uber jobs that came as a result of the internet. Mm -hmm. So those same things will happen. So I think massive unemployment is not a big worry, but rather there will be a lot of jobs, but many of the jobs that open up require training and skills that may not be had by the people who are displaced. So how to uh, help the retraining uh, probably is the most uh, important thing there. Do you think uh, China and the U.S. will need to c consider the universal basic income? I think uh, universal basic income as by itself is a terrible idea. I think um, enhanced with conditions and uh, qualifications, it, would, it, it may be something worth doing. Um, essentially, we're talking about taking care of the 40% of the people so they don't need to worry about uh, food on the table and shelter, and also training them so they can move on to the next step. So as long as those are the policies being applied, whether it's through encouraging corporations to do training, uh, whether it is um, uh, changing the mix at vocational schools, uh, whether it is the tax credit uh, given only when people have done work on improving themselves uh, towards a job that is not displaceable by AI, then I think that's a good thing. If you just give money away, then I think the main issue is that people may fall into addiction uh, or depression. And, and furthermore, I think the biggest issue is not just the loss of income, but the loss of identity. That people... I Yeah, because people um, associate their worth, many people associate their worth with the jobs they have. Uh, I do hope in 50 years we will find something better to uh, uh, identify ourselves with, but such is today's society, and we have to deal with that core issue. Mm -hmm. We have time for one or two very quick questions, if I see any hands out there. I've got plenty myself. Right in the first row here, uh, here's a... Uh, Mr. Lee. Uh, Could you introduce Lee. yourself, please? Yes, I'm uh, Ifim Ostrovsky, Virtual Metropolis, uh, uh, from Russia. Uh, would, you, uh, would you tell you ever, you ever seen or anybody ever seen the natural intellect? Do you think the natural intellect exists? The, the you know, once you are saying artificial intellect, uh, artificial intelligence, AI. Yes. So. Did anybody sometime have seen the natural intelligence? Oh, will AI ever exist? reach human natural intelligence? Does it exist? Because the human intelligence is also the artificial one. Mm. <laughs> He's, I think, wondering, is there a corollary? I see. Is it? Yeah, um, I think today artificial intelligence is actually a bit of a misnomer because what it is is a tool of optimization based on data that can lead to smart decisions within one domain. Uh, there really, when we think about our intelligence, uh, the, our ability to have common sense and reasoning and planning and creativity and uh, learn from few examples, those are things uh, a, that today's AI that does not have. And I think to cross that bridge will require a number of breakthroughs. And if we look at the last um, 63 years of AI history, there's only been one big breakthrough. Uh, and that was uh, about 10 years ago with deep learning. So to project that we'll have a bunch of breakthroughs in the coming decade to reach human intelligence, I think is uh, not only too optimistic, but naive. And Kaifu, uh, we need to uh, wrap up here, but uh, maybe this is a good thing to, to uh, close on. Uh, you close your book by saying actually that the love and compassion are two unsolved uh, issues and they give you optimism. So, so, so basically, we are not going to be able to teach machines how to love? 
Well, for those of us who watch a lot of sci-fi and don't think about it and don't understand technology, it sure looks like there is love and compassion in many of the robots that we see in the various science fiction movies. But um, AI is really just a tool that optimizes and that uh, if I think we humans are unique in, in our ability to connect to each other, to build that trust and the special feeling that you have when you see your newborn baby, uh, the f uh, fall in love the first time, those are things that are not quantifiable in any way, shape, or form by AI. So I think it's important that we believe that we are unique and special. And so far, I think no one has been proved, able to prove otherwise. And that I think if we all believe love and compassion is what holds the world together, uh, we'll certainly be a much happier world um, and, uh, and I think um, uh, AI can continue to take away routine jobs. And in some sense, that is good because uh, it liberates us from having to do them and really be able to focus on our love, which I think is uh, so unique and, and amazing for, for us. We may just need to find some different work. <laughs> yeah.